So my name is Rob. I've been uh, penetrating OPSEC for about 20 years now for the United States government and corporations. Um, OPSEC has come up a lot, and I thought I'd lend my piece. Uh, the basic gist, right, is that OPSEC is just the protection of critical information from being observed by any observing adversary. Um, this includes open source intelligence and any bleed across that happens. Uh, a lot of times I hear scuttlebutt that surveillance is uh, limited by technical capabilities. And the reality of the matter is, is I, I can't help but think to like what John Jumper said. Uh, he was United States Air Force Chief of Staff. Uh, he's in charge of SIAC right now. But basically the gist of the quote is that it comes, when it comes to technology, there are no miracles or really big hurdles or gaps to come across for what's called total informational awareness. Uh, total information awareness was supposed to be realized by 2010. OPSEC is such a wonderful thing. Uh, it's not really a part of security, and in that sense, everybody takes part in it, right? You have to educate and reinforce all activity personnel. When I say operational security, I mean activity security, not asset security. So you enforce your, you basically you educate everybody, you teach them what their critical indicators are, and you try to help them avoid it. So my background comes specifically with what's called C4ISR, and a lot of this basically is just intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Uh, whether it's using hardware platforms or whether it's using spe specified agents that you deploy to gather the data that you need. And so I think the best way, and I thought about this really hard, the best way to kind of explain why OPSEC is important is for me to kind of walk through how I pop it, right? Um, I thought this picture was kind of interesting. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, I remember seeing this on the wall once, right? And it was like, uh, so for this phase, a lot of this kind of coincides with the kill chain, but the intelligence chain is a little bit different because we don't necessarily always kill. Uh, the basic gist of this is that uh, I didn't have to find my adversary. He found me. I was minding my own business, and then I got spammed. I don't really like that that much. So um, treasure started, and we move on to the fix. When I talk about a fix, notionally it's called what I like to refer to as like WolfSec ISR. And with WolfPack ISR, effectively you, like the wolf packs, they, there's one alpha male and he's the one that does the primary hounding and the rest chase after and hound for as long as possible until they get the target. Uh, with a wolf pack ISR, you deploy multiple platforms or tracking indicators. And so this target has no way of escape. The operation detail that I observed for this specific instance, and I'm not gonna give details of the org, but uh, they basically, it was a service spam. They would register a new account. They would spam for as long as possible, and they would rotate it between their accounts to prolong the ban. It's not new news. Um, from my fixed phase, I was able to identify that there were two adversaries, T1 and T2. In the beginning, I thought it was only one. Uh, later on in the chain, we realized what was really going on. Uh, there was highly similar behavior in the beginning. It all matched the typical profile, and through some open source intelligence, I was able to determine that there was probably a guy in Romania uh, that was not actually involved in the direct spamming, but he probably had a lot to do with the money. And from there, we move on to the track. So now I've got them. I got a general gist of what they do. I got basic ways to identify them on the line. And generally when I track, um, a lot of this probably isn't new either, but I use open source intelligence. I use private intelligence that I've collected over the years. I use the ISR process to do what I call collection. I write some custom code, which normally involves algorithms or whatever. And I've been known to deploy hardware. Um, so it's really important to understand from a surveillance point of view, because uh, that's really what what we care about is what's called the indicators, right? And so there are five basic types of indicators, and they all roll together in a very nice way. Uh, the first indicator is obviously a signature. And a signature tends to be any characteristic of an activity that causes it to stand out or be identifiable. Uh, typically, they have a lot of uncommon or unique features, which reduce their ambiguity. And we have this phrase we call stability. So the more uncommon the signature, obviously, the less ambiguous it's going to be. 
so the stability is kind of a direct causality relationship. Um, procedural features generally get tied to signatures, and these are like step-by-step -step basis. What do we do first? What do we do next? What do we do next? And these typically provide some rich value. So now that I've like given a bullshit explanation, let's go ahead and actually talk about these spammers, right? Um, so the first thing that I did was I identified, I wrote a quick little module based off of Matt Weir's password grammar. And I was able to make some probability tables based on user IDs. And so what I was able to do with that is limit the character set to characters that were least common for human beings to actually use. And I was able to basically send the stream through and come up with a probability determination of whether or not this was a spammer. And these two guys, this is actually where I distinguished that there were two separate individuals. Um, one, there were two different grammars that were discovered. Uh, the grammar of the messages, I was able to pipe that through some probabilities as well. Uh, the basic gist of this, though, is they were actually really idiots because um, they did what was called a donut thing. I don't know how else to describe it, but they put the link in the exact same spot, and then they put the bullshit text around it. So the takeaway while you're defending your OPSEC about signatures is to realize that the signature stability is what makes it detectable by observers. So when you're identifying your critical information and the steps that we will get to in a bit, it's very important to realize that you don't want stability in your signatures. After we build signatures, we can build, we can take these signatures of actions to begin to re build relationships. And these relationships are very rarely um, human, right? So we have relationships between software, we have relationships between infrastructure, we have relationships between grammar, as I already mentioned. These are often compared to the past a lot, typically in a lot of data, right? Uh, the continuity of action is very important. It kind of ties into a signature, but in a lot of sense, like if I see the same repetitive practices, it's either that, it's either a repetitive practice or it's something that you're trying to do over and over again to achieve some sort of success that I may or may not realize at this time. Um, and a lot of times associations do lead to organizational patterns. So one thing that I've done a lot of times throughout the years, I determine the organizational pattern, I determine who's in charge of it, I set a command objective, and then I apply external forces to cause that organization to do what I want them to do. Some examples with the spammers is I definitely saw geographical similarities between where they were. Um, I got some names, I got some addresses, ran some books, and there was a lot of background checking that was done to kind of tie them together. They used the same software, which was kind of interesting to me, which was like this bullshit work from home uh, URL obfuscation <coughs> rotating database. And then they used the same URL HTTP 302 chaining tactics, right? Um, the gist of patterns when you're looking to design a secure OPSEC premise is that patterns are really what is used to simplify intelligence gathering. So the less patterns you have, the more unanswered questions you have, which unfortunately leads to more intelligence. But So now we've taken our signatures and we've tied them together with associations and we can start pushing them together to the gist and the crux of everything, which is like a profile. And a profile is, like I said, the signatures and the associations, you sum them all together, you build a complete picture of what you're looking at. The profiles are generally as unique as possible because you don't want to have overlap. It makes it harder for the next phase. Uh, profiles generally do have sub-profiles for each functional activity. So for the spammer, as an example, I will have a sub-profile that talks about how he registers his account or how he pops his account. And then I'll have a profile that talks about how he actually distributes the junk. And then I'll have a profile that talks about him as a person, which is uh, very important. And then the known profiles generally do cut the amount of time. So for instance, I already had a profile for the software that they were using, which enabled me to easily identify a lot of the tactics behind the bullshit they were pulling. Some examples for these guys in particular. Uh, like I said, there was they were using pretty known obfuscation techniques. Um, it wasn't any, shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, their profiles for account generation were interesting. There were definite distinctions. Uh, one guy was using what appeared to be cracked accounts, and the other guy was actually generating them himself. Um, yeah, I had, an, I had a profile for account compromises. I can't talk a lot about this, but it basically involved dates and finding indicators in the dates and time lapses between creation date, last login, shit like that. Uh, there was definitely then profiles created for each adversary, which are still on file. The gist is funny, right? I say this a couple of times to people 
And when I've said this in the government space, people are like, yeah, okay, I can accept that. But like the truth of the matter is, is anything you do in life is going to be profiled. There's no way around it. So now we've taken our associations, we turn them into profiles. Now we really deal with what I call contrasts. And contrasts are like the beauty of the work, and contrasts are how I've stayed up late many, many nights. So a contrast is just generally like, I have this observed action that I'm watching right now, and I have this expected behavior. Now how does it differ? It's very basic, right? The gist is, is I can turn these to low-level analysts, and there's no big deal because with a contrast, you don't have to understand what's going on. You just have to recognize that there's a difference between the behavior you were told to look for. Um, if I see a contrast that I don't understand, it's going to attract my attention, and it will obviously lead to much more increased collection and probably a specialized engagement phase to increase that collection. In other words, I will come hard. So with these guys, I saw there was an obfuscation technique contrast. So for instance, T2 was obviously the more sophisticated one. He had some JavaScript, he had some PHP along the chain, and he had a much deeper redirection chain. T1 just had a single box that he set up, and he was redirecting that way. Uh, the contrast against the normal user. So what I did there was I just collected a whole list of user IDs, like millions, right? And then I ran them all through my probability tables, and I was able to say, these guys I know are good accounts, and these guys I know are bad accounts, and then we were able to match some tables up. So as I fed in new usernames, I was able to tell the probability of their difference from real life. Uh, software profile contrast, so this was actually kind of funny. T1 was really dumb. Uh, I logged into his rotating database with the default username and password from the readme file and the directory that the shit was hosted in. Well, it was kind of funny. And they even had the phone number of the spammer from Michigan that writes the software and goes around the country and gives these like work from home talks about like how to spam. It was kind of cool. Uh, software profiles, yeah. T2 had a much more sophisticated difference. It was kind of cool. He took his main login out. He had SSL based logins. He was passing search back and forth. Uh, I didn't really do much to that shit though. I didn't know that, that, that box was, I think, owned by that Romanian guy, and, uh, whatever. So the gist here is that when you're developing your OPSEC process, that you need to understand that contrasts are really the most reliable means of detection. So you watch those old school spy movies, and they always talk about, oh, you know, you walk, but I, take, I never take the same route twice. You never take the same route twice because you're not trying to build a contrast with expected behavior. You want to make it so every time you're observed, there's nothing to compare it to in the previous time. And this is a lot more times easier for me to stand here and say than I actually fucking do, which is where OPDEC or MILDEC and Deception comes into play. Um, exposure is kind of the most simplest of them. It's basically the time and duration that you saw it. Uh, limiting the exposure obviously reduces any observation detail you can get. Uh, Long-term exposures will generally be rolled into profiles as part of <coughs> the overall activity. Short-term life cycles are interesting because we have these things we call interest value, right? And upon immediate observation, within a very quick amount of time, you set the interest value of whether or not you care about it. So a high interest value and a low duration exposure, sorry, will actually end up in my database for a longer period of time than would make most humans comfortable. Um, short life cycle with low interest value, I will probably make a note of it, but it's not gonna stay in the database, and I'll ignore it unless I see it again. But the questions that I had from the first viewing will be answered the second time I see it. Uh, with these guys, they had a definite account activity, and the exposures what got them, right? They were like being really greedy. It took me less than two months to count pretty much a total estimate of 30,000 accounts for T2, and right around 1,500 to 2,000 accounts for T1. Uh, I'm sure they had more. Uh, this definitely helps with post-processing, especially when I say you have small exposures, they're gonna turn into something big later. And this is, this is really important because surveillance takes time. <laughs> and I'm a patient guy, so I could be building a profile for three months and most people don't even know, I'm, I'm not even sending a packet your way yet. Like that's, that's important to say, right? Up until the track phase, I haven't even sent a packet towards these hosts. Um, key takeaway here is that indicators limited in exposure will make you the hardest to detect. So keep your actions if they are special, as small as possible, with as minimal contrasts. So I move on to the targeting phase, and I only want to talk about this for a specific reason, and that's because targeting is a process as far as I'm concerned. It is, it is a very in-depth process where 
a lot of times I go into the target phase and I decide no go quite a bit. But that doesn't mean that there's no go on that target. That just means there was no go for the objective stated. So the objective stated is my high level view. I will never say I want to pop this box. I will always just say something specific. So for these guys, the specific objective that I stated was that these guys needed to be removed from the internet. They need to stop their spamming because I don't like that. So I went to my target development, which normally increases a little bit more intelligence. I nominated both T1 and T2, and through the prioritization phase, which is where I analyze all my data, I found out that T2 was far more of a target than T1. I validated most of the data with another three weeks of collection, and then I decided to go. And the engagement phase is fun. I didn't do anything special here. I just made some phone calls. But the general gist was is I removed a lot of their adversary and infrastructure components. I worked with a couple of service providers. I banned like right around 100,000, 200,000 accounts. And then after the assess phase, which is where, where I take profile contrasts from observations and compare them to what I expected to see. So before I did any engagement, uh, the less sophisticated had a 14-day lifetime on his accounts, whereas the more sophisticated had a 45-day. Uh, after I engaged them, there was basically, the first guy was almost effectively shut down. 30-minute average for a spammer is like fucking nothing. Like, no money there, so he's probably gone. And then T2 was cut down to a 30-day. And this actually isn't a failure. It is kind of like a small re smaller reduction than I would have seen. But it just means that when I go back and I start the tracking phase, now I can collect more, and then I'm going to do more damage. And the next time, he'll probably be down to 30 minutes, and then, or he'll move on. So the main takeaway is, I guess, if you can do anything from my 16-minute and 45-second rant so far, would be that, you know, everybody is understands that with security, you identify all your assets, you assess your risks, you assess your vulnerabilities, and then you decide your mitigations. And in and, and OPSEC and legitimate operations that I've been a part of, a lot of times you identify your security assets and you identify your critical information and then things split off. So you need to think about the actions that can be seen. Every, everything from home to destination is compromised, so observation is a definite possibility. Um, you need to figure out which indicators people like me will find and which indicators we give a shit about. And then you need to select and execute measures, whether it be uh, deception or whether it be just changing up your patterns. And a prime example I can close with would be Tor, right? If you are only using Tor to send a tra attack traffic, you will be probabilistically, like, fucked. So that's pretty much all I have, 1748. I guess I can take a couple of questions, but I have to keep things kind of. What's up, buddy? So you mentioned you had a database that you used that sounds for like ninja protection. <coughs> is, that, yeah. is that your that is weird invention? Is, is it like, is it a notepad? Is it with software? Like, what are the logistics therein? So I have um, a NoSQL database that I use, that I use personally for my personal investigations, and then there definitely has been a lot of databases used in my work other places as well. Um, so as I come through these things, I basically create these little documents, and the document in the NoSQL database ends up becoming the profile, right? And then at a later date, like, literally anybody can fucking compare them. Like, it's pretty nice. Yeah. No other questions. I know I, like, fucking just went on for like 20 minutes. All right. That's all I had, really. Thanks, guys.